Hello, and welcome to this introductory video on impulse. We're going to be talking about what impulse is, again, motivating why we care, and ultimately coming up with a nice link to momentum through the impulse momentum theorem. So to consider impulse and why we care, let's think about very exciting interaction of objects, which is collision. Now, perhaps not as exciting as you were thinking, I'm just going to focus in on a collision of a tennis ball with a racket for a moment. In this image, you can see that as the tennis ball collides, quite a lot happens. The tennis ball is actually squashed and compressed. You can see it deformed in this image. What happens is as the tennis ball approaches the racket, a tiny bit of it makes contact with the racket. That tiny bit starts to stop. The rest of it continues to move. So at the start, the racket just stops a small fraction of that tennis ball. But then as we continue on, we have to stop more and more of the tennis ball until finally we stop all of it, and then we reverse that process. So if we were to graph the force exerted by the racket on the ball or by the ball on the racket, as a function of time, we would get something like this, where it rises as the ball becomes compressed, hits a maximum once the ball is fully compressed and basically all of it is being brought to a stop, and then falls off as the tennis ball expands, moving off in its new direction after having been hit. So this may seem to be quite specific, but actually this kind of graph, or at least something similar to it, applies to pretty much every collision. The deformation may not be obvious, but it usually happens, which means that every collision can be talked about in terms of having a very large force applied that varies with time, so it's a function of time. And that large force typically is only applied for a short duration. And the duration of that collision we'll call delta t, as we have down here in this plot already. Now, forces which are applied in this way, with a large magnitude for a short duration, are given the special name impulsive forces. So let's think about what is the effect of such an impulsive force. Now, we've already seen that the effect of a force in terms of changing motion depends on something like the momentum of the object to which it's applied. But of course, the effect of the force by itself, without thinking about conditions that we don't control, such as the initial velocity of the tennis ball coming to our racket, can be altered by controlling two things. We can alter the effect by controlling the strength of the force, or by controlling the duration over which we apply the force. So we can apply a large force for a very short time, or we can apply a medium strength force for a medium amount of time, or a small force for a long time. And overall, that should have the same sort of effect. Okay, so if we're thinking about things that we control when we swing our racket, well, that is exactly these last two things. And we can control the duration by, for instance, running after the ball even after we've hit it, so that we're basically pushing it all the way up to the net until we try to slam it down. Okay, very extreme example, but we control the duration. So we can collect all these things that we have control over in terms of the force that we're applying into one thing which we call the impulse and that's going to characterize the effectiveness of the force. And what the impulse will be is actually the integral of the force at every instant in time over time. So if you look at that expression and you look at this plot, you realize it's just talking about the area underneath that curve. So more often than not, we can actually simplify this calculation. And the reason we can do that is because we'll just imagine looking at this figure and we realize that if we are interested in the area, we can move this bit and put it over here, roughly speaking, and do the same on the other side so that we end up with, instead of that weird curve, a sort of rectangle that has a width of delta t and a height of something which we'll call F average, the average force with which we are actually um, hitting this tennis ball or doing whatever it is we're doing. 
So we can just write down in this case that the impulse is the average force times the duration over which we applied that average force. But now that we've calculated it, we realize we don't really have a way to test this because it's not very often that we put, say, spring scales onto our tennis racket or onto a tennis ball as it flies through the air in order to measure these forces. What we actually measure is a change in the motion of the tennis ball. We can, for instance, use little radar guns like police do to check the speed of the tennis ball as it moves away from us and then back towards us. And therefore, we can conclude what happened to change its motion or what that change in its motion was. So how can we relate this impulse to something about what happened with the actual motion? So that's the question before us. And the answer to that is that we can think about Newton's laws yet again. So if we think about Newton's laws, and we remember the information from our video on momentum, then we know that we can write down Newton's second law as F is dp dt. And then we can do a little bit of trickery and just write F dt equals dp. And then integrate both sides. Having done that, we realize that on the left here, we have what we define to be impulse, which we can also, of course, replace with F average um, delta T, the total duration. And on the right, we have the integral of every little bit of change in momentum. So that gives us the total change in momentum for the object. Okay. And if my writing isn't very neat, I've just done that here, including vector signs, just to remind us that these are, in fact, vector quantities. So that was just delta p. Now, what we've said as a result of all this, then, is over on the left, we have this impulse, which we weren't really measuring because we're not measuring forces, but we can measure the quantity on the right. So we've now been able to measure some information about the forces that occurred during that interaction. And in particular, this relationship says that the impulse of a force will be equal to the change that it causes in the motion of whatever object that it's acting upon. And that is the impulse momentum theorem and becomes quite useful for solving problems.